Amen. All right. Who can tell me what that says on the screen? Come on. Shabbat. You got the Shin, Beit, Tav, Shabbat, and then Shalom. Uh, this is a picture I took on the Sea of Galilee one year when I was there. They have all these little sailboats. That's the northern Galilee. Capernaum is just right to the left there. What is our Torah portion today? Beha Alatka, which means when you rise up, and it's, uh, you know, here we have the priest rising up to light the menorah that they had to do every day, matter of fact, twice a day, maintain it. One thing I want to point out that most people don't realize, the flames were not in the center. The flames to the left, the flame was, uh, or, or on the lamps to the left, the flames were all to the right, pointing to the center. And then the flames on the right were all to the left, pointing to the center. Do you notice they weren't in the middle? The flames were all pointing to the center flame. Yeah, that's how it was in the temple. Because the center flame is what is so important. And you're going to see why. Now, you also have to remember that whatever the name of the Torah portion is, the theme usually goes throughout the whole Torah portion. Well, in Numbers 8, verse 1 through 5, this is the beginning. It says, now the Lord spoke to Moses and he said, tell Aaron and say to him, when you set up the lamps, the seven lamps shall give light in front of the lampstand. So Aaron set up the lamps in front of the lampstand as the Lord commanded Moses. And then it says, this was the workmanship of the lampstand. It was hammered works of gold. We know gold speaks of divinity. I think it's fascinating that Yeshua was basically hammered or beaten into gold. And the, the lampstand represents Yeshua. And then what do we have here? It says, according to, uh, well, it says, from its base to its flowers, it was hammered work. Mentions it twice. According to the pattern that the Lord had shown Moses, so he made the lampstand. So remember, it says after the pattern, what pattern? The menorah in heaven. And so the menorah in heaven is of hammered work. Now look at Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire. Wow, this is speaking about the one in heaven, that the one in the earthly tabernacle was patterned after. Burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And y'all remember what the seven spirits of God are from Isaiah, I think it's 11. It goes through the seven spirits of God, wisdom and understanding, okay? Now, I want to jump, though, for a moment. Here we have the seven lamps of fire. Now, which represent the seven spirits. We also know it represents the seven churches. There's layers. One doesn't get rid of the other one. It's just another layer. The Haftor today, which I think is incredible, uh, is Zechariah 2, verse 10, all the way through 4, verse 7. Look how it ties in to the Torah portion. It says, the angel that was talking uh, with me, Zechariah, came back and he woke me up as a man that is awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I looked and there was a candlestick, all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps, seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof. So he sees the heavenly menorah. Now look at 3, 8 through 10. It says, Here now, Joshua, who is the high priest, you and your fellows who sit before you, they are men who are a sign. And then he says, Behold, I will bring forth my servant. And what's his name? The branch. Okay, Netzer. He says, for behold, the stone that I have set before Joshua on one stone are seven eyes. And he says, behold, I will engrave its engraving, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in what day? What 
is the one day he's going to remove the iniquity of the land of Israel. Yom Kippur. That is the day. This is telling us that is the day this is going to happen. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, you will invite every man his neighbor and under the vine and under the big tree. Now let's go back to Zechariah 4, 5, and 6. The angel that talked with me answered and said to me, do you know what these are? And I said, no. And he said, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Well, let's go to Revelation 5, 6. And I beheld in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and the midst of the elders stood a lamb as if it had been slain, having seven whores, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God going forth into all the earth. Wow. So it's not like only one answer is right. We see it's not just the seven churches. It's also the seven spirits. It's also the seven eyes. Okay, so there's many right answers uh, when we look at these things. But the, the seven eyes you can think of as the seven spirits. And we know that the seven assemblies are to be the light in the darkness. Okay? Now, look at Revelation 1, verse 4 through 8. Yochanan. Wow. Who is Yochanan? John. And what does Yochanan mean? Okay, let me give you a hint. Let's break it down. What does Canaan mean? Canaan. That, we're going to teach on that today. Canaan means to be gracious. So Yochanan means Yah is gracious. He's merciful. He's kind. That's, what it, that's the problem with English. You eliminate the meanings. Anyway, uh, it says to the seven assemblies that are in Asia, notice it didn't say Europe. It's not Rome. Okay, it says Asia, grace to you and peace. That's like Canaan to you and peace from God who is, who was, and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Is everyone seeing these connections all through the Bible? And from Yeshua, the Messiah, who is the faithful witness the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us. See, it's a, a Melech. He loves us, and he just wants people who love him back. He washed us from our sins by his blood. He made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And behold, he is coming, and he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, including those who pierced him. All the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Even so, amen. And then Yeshua says, I am the Aleph and the Tav, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. So Yeshua is the word. And the word is from Aleph to Tav, or A to Z. Every word in the dictionary, A to Z, well, every word in Hebrew is all left to Tov. And look at Revelation 1, 10, and 11. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. When it says the Lord's day, what day is it referring to? Not Saturday, not Sunday. It was referring to the day of the Lord. This whole book is about the day of the Lord. And he hears this voice like a shofar. Doo -doo, I am. I am. Okay, I am. That's important. Who is the I am? The Aleph and the Tav, the first and the last, and write in a book what you see. Now look at verse 12 through 14. John turns to see the voice that spoke with him, and being turned, I said, what did he see? A menorah. And in the midst of the menorah was one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, uh, girt about with a golden girdle, his head and his hairs were like white, uh, white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as flames of fire. Okay, so what do we see here? Right in the middle is the Aleph Tov. The Aleph Tov is Yeshua. And what's amazing, when you look at Genesis 1, 1, 
in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. English is horrible because in Hebrew, there are seven Hebrew words that match up exactly with the seven lampstands. And the middle one is Aleph Tav, which isn't even translated into English. Bereshit, bara Elohim, verse 3, Aleph Tav. There he is, the Aleph Tav. But you don't see that in English. Okay, so this is what's amazing. John, in John 1, sees in Hebrew, in the beginning, in the middle, is the Aleph Tav. Which is why, look at John 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning was what? The Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He he looked at the uh, Genesis 1, 1 in Hebrew. And the fourth word is all left off. And that's Yeshua. So it's just amazing that you have the seven branch menorah with the seven words in Hebrew in Genesis 1, 1. In the middle is Yeshua, the all left off. You're not going to see any of that in English. Let's go now to Numbers 9 in the next chapter of our Torah portion. It says in verse 1 through 3, the Lord speaks to Moses again in the wilderness. It's in the first month of the second year. Okay, what's the name of the month? Nisan. Okay, and they left in Nisan. So this is the second year. Okay, so they had their first year is done. They've just begun the second year. They haven't completed two years. It's the beginning of the second year after they came out of Egypt. And it said, let the children of Israel keep the Passover at his appointed season. Notice it's not its appointed season. It's his appointed season. On the 14th day of this month at even, you shall keep it in his appointed season. According to all the rites, according to all the ceremonies, shall you keep it. A couple of things I want to bring up here. Again, it has to be kept in the spring. This is telling you, see, in Islam, they only go by the moon, which is why Ramadan can be in April one year, July another year, November another year, okay? And they don't keep it by the sun only. And if you keep it only by the sun, you'll be celebrating Easter a month before Passover, which is really dumb, which is why you got to be on God's calendar so you do it when he says. I mean, if you guys got married on April 1st and your spouse says, I'm going to start celebrating it on November 1st, you'll say, what's your problem? Okay. Or I want to keep it according to the Muslim calendar. Or I want to keep it according to the pagan calendar. Um, Okay. Anyway, it also says, according to all the rites, the ceremonies, well, guess what? We don't know any of the rites. We don't know any of the ceremonies. The only way we find what those were is if we read Jewish history. Now, <clears throat> what day was the tabernacle reared up? Mo- <clears throat> Moses' tabernacle. Did anybody remember what day it was? It was Nisan 1, <clears throat> the first of Nisan. That's when it was set up. <clears throat> now, the Lord tells Moses, speak to the children of Israel, if any one of your descendants is unclean by touching a dead body, first off, who just died? Anybody die on that first day of Nisan? Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu just died. It was Nisan 1, and now people had to handle the dead body, and now it's like, oh, good grief, I want to keep the Passover, but I'm unclean. It says, uh, through touching a dead body, or maybe you're on a long journey, he will still keep the Passover to the Lord in the second month on the 14th day at twilight shall they keep it. So the Lord just said it's okay to keep the Passover in the second month, right? And we know around 300 AD, Constantine said, that's the stupidest thing he's ever heard, so we're going to do it when we want to do it on the solar calendar. And he says, that's not what the Bible says at all, because he was clueless. Okay, Uh, uh, let's see. So now let's go to Numbers 9, 15, and 16. On the day the tabernacle was reared up. So notice we're in Numbers 9, but it's talking about Nisan 1, because that's the day it was reared up. The cloud covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of the testimony, and then at even there was upon the tabernacle as it was the appearance of fire until the morning. So it was... Always that way. The cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. 
<clears throat> and when did they move? They only would move <clears throat> when the Lord said it's time to move. Well, that's so important. We want to move with the Lord. We don't want to get ahead. We don't want to get behind. Now, <clears throat> here comes Numbers 10. It came to pass on the 20th day of the second month in the second year. What's the name of the second month? What's the month after Nisan? A year, exactly. And it's the 12th day, so it's about halfway through. And it's the second year, so they're about to take the promised land. They've been there for a year, okay? They had a year rest, a year vacation. And now it's time to get to work. And it says the cloud was taken up off from the tabernacle. Oop, that means it's time to go. And so the children of Israel took their journeys out of the wilderness of Sinai, and the cloud rested in the wilderness of Paran. Okay, <clears throat> so now watch what happens. This is important because in Numbers 10, where are they headed? God, if you read Numbers 10, they get organized by their armies. Okay, so now uh, just like you get a bunch of ragtag people leaving Egypt, they're, not, they're unified, but not really unified. It's just mass chaos running into the promised land. But now God has to get them organized like an army because they're about to attack, okay, to enter the promised land. So they're all organized. And then look at Numbers 10, 33 and 34. It says, they departed from the mount of the Lord and they go on a three hour tour. No, a three day journey. After, I mean, they've rested for an entire year and they traveled three days. And then the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them in the three days journey. And it was searching out a place to rest. And the cloud of the Lord was upon them by day and when they went out of the camp. Okay, so how long did they rest? A year. Okay, over a year. The one thing is, could that have been a Shemitah year, the year that they rested? Wouldn't that be interesting thing to look at? Shazam. Okay, now look at Numbers 10. Verse 35, it came to pass when the ark set forward, Moses said, rise up, Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let those that hate you flee from before you. And then in verse 36, it says, and when it rested, he said, return, O Lord, to the many thousands of Israel. Do you want to know what's crazy about those two verses? Those two verses are so set apart that the Jews say by itself it should be the sixth book of the Torah because this is so powerful. Now, here is the letter noon on the left, but in Moses' day, it looks like our N. It becomes our N, noon and N. Uh, it's like a fish darting through water. The noon numerical value is 50, like for Jubilee, okay? It's the 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the noon means fish, but it means fish that are flipping all over the place, alive. Have, how many of you have ever been out in the ocean and seen the water boiling with fish? Oh, I've been there. there we have been out there on the charter boat fishing and uh, the fish were just boiling. We had double hooks on our lines. We'd throw it out and we'd get two fish at once and we're bringing it back in. It was absolutely Okay, so here we have the beach, the live fish, the dead fish. Okay, I want to show you this verse. and You can see it in the Hebrew scroll. It is like this. It has two upside down letter noons surrounding that verse like two parentheses. Well, the noon means fish. Well, these are backwards and upside down, so it symbolizes dead fish. Every Torah scroll that's ever been written has these two upside down backward letter noons, and the noon represents life. It's a fish. Now, take a look at this. 
Whenever the ark set out, what did Moses say? He said, rise up, O Lord. May your enemies be scattered. May your foes flee before you. Whenever it came to rest, he said, return, O Lord, to the countless thousands of Israel. And we have these two dead fish. Upside down and backwards. Okay. So now, let me show you this. Nowhere else, nowhere else does this ever happen. This is a, a big anomaly, which is why the Jews says this is such an anomaly. It almost should be a separate book. What could it mean? Well, here's what's fascinating. They end up messing up, and they have to be in the wilderness for 38 more years. But, you know, it's like, rise up and go get them, God, and they whine and they complain. Okay, well, guess what? Here it says, rise up, O Lord. This refers to the resurrection of Messiah when he rose from the dead. And then when it says, return, O Lord, that refers to believers who rise up when he returns. And believers are known as the fish symbol as it is. Isn't that amazing? So this is really a prophecy of the resurrection of the Messiah and the resurrection of the believers at his return. And, and this is in Numbers 10 when they're about to take the promised land and here we are ready to take the promised land and there's going to be a resurrection real soon when he returns. Now, let me show you this. Here are the 22 Hebrew letters. And as I said, the letter noon is the 14th letter. Well, the 14th letter. King David is made up of a D, which is the number four. Matter of fact, two Ds. And the Vav, which is six. And so David numerically equals 14. Isn't that fascinating? And this is why... In Matthew 1, it says 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations, because he's saying this is the Messiah, son of David, son of David, son of David. But if you don't know the 14 and the David, you don't even read that in Matthew 1. 1. So the letter new equals a live fish, okay, which equals 14, which refers to King David sitting on his throne, and this is exactly who Messiah is, the son of David. Now, isn't that fun? Okay, so now we have uh, already learned that the camp only travels when the cloud is what? Lifted up, lifted up, and here Moses is calling God to be lifted up, and the cloud lifts, and the nation marches forward. Okay, now, when God tells us to strike camp and move forward, we have to carry the ark with us. That's important. The privilege and responsibility of God's nearness, both his voice and his ear, is carried in our hands and in our heart. Just as the Levites carried the ark, we carry God's Torah and presence in our lives and in our generations. If we're kings and priests, we need to be carrying the Torah, which is in the ark, with us everywhere we go. We can't move without it, right? <clears throat> okay. The journey that they were supposed to take when they went on the three-day journey was only to take 11 days. And instead, it takes 40 years. But what happens? With the opening of this very next chapter, 11, everything begins to crash. The nation complains repeatedly, and they're punished. Miriam speaks against her brother and his wife, and she is punished. And then, worst of all, comes the sin of the spies. And now an entire generation would die in the desert and never see the promise. It's amazing that so much going for them, and in an instant, everything crashes. You know, one thing that I can't believe, uh, and this, I'm speaking for myself as well as all of us, but you see some of these 
high school or college sports stars, or they get they get ready for the pros, they're about to go to the pros, and then they screw it up and lose it all. And you wonder how in the world can you be training your whole life to do this particular thing, and you're about to do it, and then you screw up, <laughs> you blow it. I mean, it's just that has just always amazed me. Look at Numbers eleven one, when the people complain. It displeased the Lord. The Lord heard it. His anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the outer parts of the camp. Wow, they only traveled three days after a year vacation and they're already complaining. You know, um, let's look at Numbers 11, 4 through 6. Now we see the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel wept again. And they said, who's going to give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we ate in Egypt. And it was free from the government. (laughs) Oh, I I just, you know, adding some things there. The cucumbers and melons, the leeks and onions and garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There's nothing at all besides this stinking manna before our eyes. You know, they didn't remember their children being slaughtered and thrown into the Nile. All they don't, I mean, they don't remember the horrendous things. Being, all they remember is the government handouts. Hello? Um, and they hated the manna. So, you know, here they are. They're out there gathering <coughs> manna because they're supposed to eat. Here it is. The bread from heaven. Who is the bread that came down from heaven? Yeshua. Well, have I got something to show you. Here is Proverbs 30, verse 4, where it says, Who's ascended into heaven or descended? Who gathered the wind in his vest? Who bound the waters in a garment? Who established all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is his son's name, if you can tell. Wow, we have a his name and his son's name. Well, that tells you that whoever was able to create the earth has a son. Well, isn't that fascinating? Right there, how can you deny that the father has a son when it says right there he has a son? But I want you to catch something. On the far right, the M or the Mem and the He, Ma. Ma is what? That means what in Hebrew. And then it has Shemo. See the Shin, Mem, Vav. Shemo. Shem is name. Shemo is his name versus their name, our name. So right there where it says what is his name and what is his son's name, you have what is his name. Now, I want to show you this. Here we are in Exodus 16, 31, talking about the manna. And what does it say? The house of Israel call his name manna. In English, it says its name manna. It's, we think of manna as an it. But the Bible doesn't say it. It says his name is manna. Wow, what an eye opener. So what's his name? Manna. And how is it spelled? Mana. Mem noon. That's the final noon. So right there, I want how do you spell manna in Hebrew? Mem noon. Man. Okay? Manna. Now here is this Proverbs 30, verse 4 through 6. Again, and I separated it. It's like a puzzle. God is having a puzzle that he wants us to solve. And he says, okay, who ascended? Who gathered the wind? Who bound the waters? Who established all the ends of the earth? And everyone's saying, well, I know who that is. And then it says, okay, what is his name? And then it says, and what is his son's name? If you can tell. So we're supposed to answer those two questions. Now, what do the Jewish people call God? No, they don't want to use the Lord's name. They call him Hashem. Because Shem is name, ha is the the name. They just say, you know, the name. Ooh, when they say Hashem, they know that 
they're referring to. You know what I'm saying? Just like little kids don't call their dad John. They say dad. So that's the concept. The Jews just say Hashem, the name. And how do you spell Hashem? Hey, sh- okay, the Shin and the Mem. Okay, here is Proverbs 30, verse 4 through 6 in a diagram. This is the first letter, the Mem in orange, going this way, all the way down to the Tav. That's the end of the verse, but I have the other letters beginning and ending. This is the phrase, the Vav is and, Ma is what, Shem is name, uh, and then Ben, his name, okay, Beno. So you see, and what name is his sons? Does everyone see that? Everyone see that? Now, the very last line there says, and you better not add to his word. Don't you be adding to his words. You know, like it says in Deuteronomy 4, Revelation 22, don't add, don't subtract. Well, here's what's amazing. What is his name? We see Hashem right there. The name. And then we want to know what is his son's name. And you say, Yeshua. Yeshua, what is his son's name? And right there you see Yeshua is his name. Oh, but wait, there is more. See, right there, Yeshua. And it forms a cross. Now, get a load of this. Yeshua was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him and a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Well, the spirit descending on him, what's the Hebrew word for spirit? Ruach, which is the resh, vav, het. And right above that is ruach descending upon Yeshua in Proverbs 30, 4 through 6 in Hebrew. But, This morning, the reason why I added this, God showed me something else. Here I am reading the Torah portion, and his name is what in the Torah portion? Or in Exodus 16, 31. His name is manna. So I thought, well, wait a minute. This is all about his name and his son's name. So if his name is manna, I got to see if manna is in this verse. So I go and I look, and right there is the Memnoon. His name is Manna as well. I mean, this, 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 I just saw this this morning because I'm reading how his name is Manna. And I thought, wow, it's got to be in here then. And there it is. And that is just insane to me because that is the only letter noon in the entire phrase that is highlighted. And it's all about what is his name. Are you going to see this in English? Okay, that's why Hebrew is the heavenly language. Matter of fact, look at this. In Isaiah 48, 12 and 13. You guys got to remember this verse. The question is, who is me? So let's find out who is me. Who is me in this sentence? Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he. I am the first. I also am the last. My hand has laid the foundations of the earth. My right hand has spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they go, yes, sir. Who is the me here? Well, let's look at the next. Here we go. It's not going. Okay, so let me do it this way. Come near to me. And hear this, I've not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was, I was there, okay, the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. Wow, wait a minute, what is going on here? Here we have... In Isaiah 48, 16, the Lord God 
in his spirit have sent me. And who is the me? The one who created everything. This shows you the triunity of God. This is the only, this is the main place. And it's in the Tanakh. Let that just kind of sink in. This is why you need to remember this verse. What time is it? Okay, I love it. And now that's Isaiah 48. Man, that's, this is an important verse to be looking at. Okay, so see in Exodus 16, 31 on your notes, it says, and the house of Israel call its name manna. Wrong translation. It's his name is manna. This is why I don't like English. Okay, Numbers eleven ten. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was upset. And he says in 12 through 15, did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth that you would come and say to me, come carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give all these people? They weep before me and say, give me meat that we might eat. I'm not able to carry all these people. The burden's too heavy. If you're going to treat me like this, God, kill me now. <laughs> if I find favor in your sight, please kill me. Then I don't have to see my wretchedness. So the Lord says quail. And then in Numbers 11:33, while the meat was yet between their teeth, before it was even consumed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people. The Lord struck down the people with a very great plague. And then in Numbers 12, Miriam and Aaron speak against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman who he married, for he married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? He's not spoken also by us, has he not? And the Lord heard it. And so the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. When the cloud removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous like snow, and Aaron turned toward Miriam, and she was leprous. So here was the problem. Miriam was white, and she was prejudiced against black people. And so God says, you like white, I will make you white. And made her leprous. That is what happened. Okay. Um, there was something else, but I left my mind. Oh, God. Okay, I think I'm running late, so let's stand. Avinu Mokane, our Father King, we just thank you so much that we could come and worship you and praise you, and that your word is always a living word to us how we shouldn't be whiners and complainers and gossipers. But, Father, uh, we shouldn't always have bad attitude toward others. We don't want to be grumblers and complainers. Father, I just pray right now that you would speak in all of hearts that we would love you, love our neighbor, and advance your kingdom. So I thank you so much for all those who so willingly give into your kingdom, uh, working through here at El Shaddai. Well, we want to take a lot of your tour to all of the world. Amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit. Through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. This is going to be a kind of a continuation of uh, last week about Names. Now, we know biblical names are supposed to have meaning. The problem is most of us, when we read the genealogy or the names, it's like blah, 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 blah. Let's skip over and go to something that's important, you know. Uh, but how many of you know names are extremely important when God gives the name? <clears throat> wow, that makes it very important. Even so... When it's a name, he calls himself. When he goes, okay, this is, wow, because naming implies character. It tells us about the person. Uh, name describes your character, your attributes, who you are. And so my name is, or my question is, what would you name yourself? If you got to pick your own name and you wanted it to have Meaning, for, I mean, uh, 
Can you play this right now? Go ahead. Okay. So here, I've got the name of your business. I mean, if you're going to name something, like you're going to name your business, what name would you give your business? You want it to have meaning, right? What name uh, would you put on your business card? I mean, the name is telling everybody who you are. What would you name? I mean, some of the people that name their kids, I feel so sorry to be that kid. <laughs> that, uh, I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, the plane industry. Lear Jet is there. And Mr. Lear named his daughter Crystal. But her middle name is Shanda. So her name is Crystal Shanda Lear. Oh, I mean, this is ridiculous. Uh, because the name identifies who you are. So, oh, it's not, it's not going to work, Jill. Oh, wait, here it is. How would you like to have one of these names? Robin Banks. Hi, I'm Robin Banks. Yeah. So, the, I mean, what would you name, how, how would you like to name yourself? If you were to name who you are, who you think your character is, what you're all about, like even on your headstone, you'd want to write something, you know, significant. But what name would you call yourself? The reason why I bring this up as well is get a load of this. How many of you like to read genealogies? Boo. Okay, well, get a load of this. This is the genealogy of the 10 generations from Adam to Noah. Now, when we look at that, it's, uh, you know, Adam says, you know, blah, 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 blah. But the question is, what do their names mean? I sat down with an Israeli out of McDonald's in Haifa, and uh, they, this was back when they had Israel soldiers guarding at McDonald's and everything, and he was sitting there with another Israeli, and our tour group was there, and we were sitting at another table, and so I just kind of moved over to him and just started talking, because I liked uh, conversations, and he spoke English, and I said, you got to help me here. I don't know Hebrew like you you do. Could you help me look at these 10 generations? And he goes, sure. I said, now, Adam, that means uh, mankind, right? Okay, I'm going to have to take this out, Jill, because it's just not working. And we wrote down mankind. That's what Adam means, mankind. And I said, well, now, Seth was appointed to take Abel's place. What does Seth's name mean? Oh, well, his name means to be appointed to. And I said, okay, well, the next one is Enosh. Well, that's feeble, frail, mortal. Well, what's Canaan mean? Well, that is a fixed dwelling place, like a home compared to a tent. Well, Mahalia, what does that mean? God who is praised. Well, Yared, what does Yared mean? It means to come down or descend. Well, we all know who Enoch is, and when we think of Hanukkah, Enoch and Hanukkah, and Enoch means to instruct. Well, how about Methuselah? He was the father of Methuselah. Well, his name means someone who was sent to die. Oh, my goodness. How about Lamech? Oh, that means to be beaten, to be tortured. Well, what about Noah? Well, no one means to bring rest or a quiet peace. I said, okay, well, let's look at this. Mankind is appointed to feeble, frail mortality, a fixed dwelling place. But God, who is praised, comes down to instruct. He was sent to die by being beaten and tortured to bring rest or quiet peace. And his eyes get about this big, and he takes the paper and he shoves it over to me, you know. But I planted a seed. But this is why... You want to understand how important names are. Oh my gosh. It's all about the names. So now with that said, 
Let's look at Genesis 1, 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, God, what is the Hebrew name for God here? Elohim. Why the word Elohim or God is used 32 times just in Genesis 1. Just, it's always Elohim, 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 Elohim. Because that's telling, God is trying to communicate with us who he is, his nature, his character. Elohim means the boss, the creator, the king, the judge. Okay? But what happens? In Genesis 2, man is created, and God knew that man could not live by strict justice alone, so he adds a new name, the Lord God. And what's the Hebrew word for the Lord is the yud heh vav heh the Tetragrammaton. Because yud heh vav heh shows the nature of mercy, compassion, love. So he's not just the judge, he's the loving judge, the merciful judge. So it gives us another idea of his nature and his character. Look at Genesis 2, 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth. When they were created in the day, the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. I think it's interesting. It goes from heaven and earth, and then it switches from earth to heaven. Now, the word Lord God is what is used all the time in Genesis 2. It's used 11 times. When God's name is Lord God, that typically is used in a covenantal relationship. He's going to make a covenantal relationship. In other words, he'll be merciful when we break it. Okay? It's not just Elohim making covenant, but it's the merciful God who is making covenant. Now, with a covenant, the implications are always that both people have a responsibility. When God made a covenant with Abraham, what did he do? He gave him a new name. And when we get married to the Messiah we get a new name. When ladies get married, what do they get? A new name. So covenant implies a new name. Now, how many of us know we definitely got the better end of the deal <laughs> on that covenant with God? Okay. All right. Well, listen to Revelation 2.7. Whoever has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the assemblies. To him that overcomes, they get to eat of the hidden manna. And I will give him a white stone. And in the stone, what do they get? A new name, which no one knows but the one who receives it. You are going to get a special secret name. It's just like when parents call their own kids a nickname. Okay? Okay. None of the other kids get that name. Only you get that name. Anyone have a nickname that their parents gave them? I won't tell you mine. <laughs> I had several. Look at Revelation 3, 12 and 13. To him that overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. He won't go any more out, and I will write upon him what? the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Wow. We're going to get a new name. Then we're also going to have the name of God on us, the name of the city of God on us, and he writes his own new name. Yeshua is going to get a new name. He's already got about 100, and he's going to get another one. Now look at John 14, 13 and 14. Whatever you shall ask in my name, I'll do it. And the reason why I'll do it is so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. The Son is not concerned about his own glory. The Son is always concerned about the Father's glory, which is why he said the prayer is not to him, but our Father who art in heaven, okay? And then it says, if you will ask anything in my name, I'll do it. But we got to realize this isn't to be thought of as some magic incantation formula to get the desired results. 
or simply reciting his name over and over as some formulated prayer. There is a cult group, and I do mean a cult group. A witness Lee was a wonderful guy, but he had a disciple named um, Sung Young Lee or Witness Lee. Witness Lee. And Witness Lee started a cult uh, because he's in the Eastern mysticism, Chinese stuff. Anyway, uh, they will always say, Jesus, 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 like a hundred times. They go, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I mean, that is like, and they're trying to get themselves worked up into some kind of a thing. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's not saying, just say my name. Plus, that's not even his name. <laughs> okay. So if we want something, we have to not only do it with the right name, but with the right attitude. He's not something you can just say his magic name six times and be saved. Okay. Or have anything happen. Okay. Now, um, I think this is especially true when we don't even have a concept of what his name really is. What Yeshua was saying was that he's in covenant with us. Now, I'm going to share something with you that is also going to be... Everybody buckled in? Shoulder straps on? Look at Romans 10, 12. It says there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. What does that mean? There's no difference between the Jew or the Gentile. There's, how many differences are there? None. For the same Lord is over both of them. The Lord of the Jew is the Lord of the Gentiles. Oh my gosh. And he's rich unto all that Call upon him. If the Jew calls upon him and the Gentiles call upon him, who's him? Watch this. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? How many of you have heard that? What's his name? Well, let's look. Remember, there's nothing new in the New Testament. It's just the Jews giving an explanation of what the Old Testament was calling about. When Paul says, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, was he initiating something new, or was he talking about something that is already well known to all the Jews? It's something that's already well known to all the Jews. I will prove it to you. Look at Psalms 55, 16. As for me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall do what? About 15 times in the Old Testament it says this. Okay, look at Deuteronomy 4, 7. What nation is there so great who has a God so near to them as the Lord? Our God is in all things that we call upon him for. Look at 1 Chronicles 16, 8. Give thanks to the Lord. This is the yud heh now. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Psalm 18, 3. I will call upon the Lord, the yud heh who's worthy to be praised. So shall I be what? Saved from my enemies. Look at Psalm 105, 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, the yud heh Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Psalm 116, 17, I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and I will call upon the name of the Lord. Psalm 145, 18, the Lord is near to all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. So when Paul says, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, who is the Lord? The yud Hey vav Hey. Matter of fact, let's look at Isaiah 55. Five, verse 6 and 7. Seek you the Lord while he may be found. That's better seek the Yudhei Vafi while he can be found. Call upon him. There it is while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to who? The Lord. And he will have mercy on him and to our God. He will abundantly pardon. So who's the one who forgives us and pardons us? The Lord. 
the Yud Hey Vav Hey. Now we all know Yeshua is the Yud Hey Vav Hey. Look at Zephaniah 3 9. We mentioned this last week. God says, Then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord, the Yud Hey Vav Hey. So guess what? All nations and tongues are going to pronounce the Yud Hey Vav Hey. They're going to call upon him in Hebrew, not English. Not Spanish, not Persian. God is going to make everyone call upon him, not in English. It's going to be in Hebrew. God's goal is for everyone to call upon the Lord with his Hebrew name, because Hebrew names have meanings that is totally lost in every other language. When you look at Jesus, what does Jesus mean? Well, it doesn't mean anything. Okay, but his real name, Yeshua, means salvation, and all who call upon him will be saved. Look at Isaiah 44. This is verse 3 through 5. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your seed, my blessing on your offspring, and they will spring up among the grass as willows by the water courses. And look at this. One is going to say, I am the Yudhevaves. And another will call himself by the name of Yaakov, and another one shall scribe with his hand unto the Lord and surname himself by the name of Israel. Wow, different people are going to call on different names, but notice, it also didn't say, and some will call themselves Baptists and Catholics and Presbyterians and Lutherans. Those aren't the choices. Now look at Romans 9, 15 and 16. For God, the Lord, said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not him that wills nor him that runs, but it's of God that shows mercy. Now, when you first read that, you say, ooh, that's tough. Man, God's tough. He says, I'll have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But you know what the problem is? English. Let me uh, tell you a quick story. There's different Hebrew words for mercy. Okay, so I like to give the example of an orphanage. And there's, let's say, 100 kids in the orphanage. Some are good, some are bad, okay? Well, as you know, one level of mercy is chesed, which God, the sun, shines on the good and the bad. The rain falls on the good and the bad. Okay, so I take in a hundred cookies to give each one of the little kids in the orphanage a cookie. That's chesed. Okay, but then there's kanon, which means to get personally involved with someone. Okay, so here's one of the little kids at the orphanage, and they're too short and can't reach the cookie jar. But they're also the meanest kid in the orphanage. They beat up on everybody. Well, even though they're bad, I will get involved, I'll pick him up, and I'll make sure he gets his cookie. That's Canaan. That means you're merciful or gracious. You even get personally involved with those, you know, who aren't totally obedient. Then the next level is Rakam or Rachum, which is another level of mercy involving, it's the same word as the mother's womb. It means I am so merciful that I'm going to adopt this kid. I'm going to take this kid home. Okay, so when God says, I'll have mercy on whom I will have mercy and compassion on whom I will have compassion, which one of those is he talking about? Well, you have to go back and look at the Hebrew in the Torah. We see in Exodus 33, 18 and 19, it says, Moses is telling God he wants to see his glory And God says, okay, I'm going to make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Well, we ought to know if we're going to call upon his name, what's his name? Well, he says, he doesn't, I'd have to look at the Hebrew again. I'd I'd like to look at the Hebrew. I don't know if one of you can, uh, but it does he say, I'm going to proclaim the names, plural, of the Lord? Or does he say, I'm going to proclaim the name, singular? Because he gives us 13 different names. 
So I'd be interested now to go back and look at that word in Hebrew to see if it is in the plural or in the singular. I just thought of that right now. But listen to this. Then it says, I proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Well, now we got to figure out what in the world is he talking about. Well, let me show you here. This is Exodus 34, verse 6. And you'll notice you have all three forms of mercy in this one verse. You have rakum, you have vekanun, and you have kesed. Okay, so the Lord passed by before, proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, that's rakum, gracious, that's kanun, chesed, that's goodness. Okay, so all three are mentioned. And then look here at verse 7. Here, chesed, which is translated as goodness in verse 6, is translated as mercy in verse 7. Okay, so there's three, and God is saying, I'm going to, I have all three layers of mercy and goodness. You following me? Okay. So here we see now the names of the Lord. We call upon the name of the Lord. Here's his names. The first one is the Lord. Then it's the Lord God. Then his name is merciful. His name is gracious. His name is long-suffering. His name is abundant in goodness. His name is abundant in truth. His name is keeping mercy for thousands. His name is forgiving iniquity, forgiving transgressions, forgiving sins, by no means clearing the guilty. Wow, what's God's name? Right here, there's over 100 names of God. But just like there's 613 commandments, he chose 10 commandments that were special. He has hundreds of names, but he chose 13 names to let us know about his character. So we're going to, I'm going to be going over the next couple of weeks, each one of these names, so you can get the essence of who God says he is. It's not just to be a name to memorize. I want this to be a name where you feel God's heart. You know what I'm saying? I want you to get to know your dad at a deeper level, not at a surface level. So that's what we're going to do. You see in Exodus 34, 5 through 8, how the Lord, the yud heh descended in the cloud, and he stood with Moses there. And what does he do? He proclaims the name of the Lord, and the Lord passed by before him. And here's what he proclaimed. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness, abundant in truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. And just so you know, that's in the order of how he forgives. He forgives the, the most horrible sin, okay, uh, medium sin, and a little sin. But he just says he forgives at every level. Keeping, um, uh, let's see, and will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, to the third and fourth generation. Moses makes haste, bows his head toward the earth, and he worships. Okay, Moses, our God, proclaimed his name, right? What happens when God speaks his name? Things become visible. God said, let there be light, and boom! There was light. He just said light exists, and light existed. So whenever God speaks, there's a visible reality that is to be seen. His word has power. So in Genesis, God says light. Light is manifested. His words create the reality. Or you might say become the vehicle that carries the manifestation. For Moses who wanted to see or behold God's glory, the word of God had to be manifested in a visible form. He saw Yeshua. He saw the word of God being manifested in a visible form. When God said mercy and grace, Moses didn't just hear the words mercy and grace, he saw mercy and grace. He didn't just hear the word truth. He saw truth being manifested. Moses didn't just hear God's words being proclaimed. He saw the word of God manifested. 
Now listen to John 1, 12 through 15. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born. But look at this. They're not born of flesh and blood, nor of the will of man, but of God. They're born again. Okay, they, be, they experience a rebirth. And then it says, the word was made flesh. God's word became visible and dwelt among us. And look at this. Just as Moses wanted to see his glory, we beheld his glory. Yeshua was the glory that was manifested. And the glory is of the begotten of Father, full of what? Grace and truth. That's what he talked about in Exodus. That's who he is. So how can one say, well, the God of the Old Testament was mean and the God of the New Testament is kind? What are you talking about? The God of the Old Testament already proclaimed was mercy and love and forgiveness. Let's go to Exodus 33, 20 through 23. God initially told Moses, you can't see my face for no one can see me and live. And the Yudevah, they said, behold, there's a place by me. You shall stand on a rock. It'll come to pass when my glory passes. I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll cover you with my hand while I pass by. And then I'll take away my hand and you can see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. So in order for Moses to see God's glory, Moses had to hear God speak and proclaim his name. Now, the Shekinah itself over the tabernacle for 40 years was a manifestation of God's uh, presence to the world. Now, let me ask you something. Since there's a tabernacle in heaven, why didn't God send a pre-made tabernacle from heaven down to Moses for his glory to be revealed? He could have done that. He could have said, hey, I have this awesome tabernacle I'm going to send down and you can everybody come to this glorious tabernacle. Well, and the thing is this, he wanted his kids to build something for him. It's about relationship. It's not about how great God is. It's about, look, my kids want to build a house for me. He wanted to show Satan, they're, they're, I created these humans and they like me. They want to build a house for me, all right? And so, <clears throat> how is mankind the greatest act of creation? Why was creating humans the greatest act of creation? Because God gave us the ability to bring his presence into the world and crown him as king, which none of the rest of creation could do. Only humans could bring God down into this world that he made. Now, when we declare the recognition of God's name as revealed to Moses, it has a direct effect on its manifestation in this world. God responds to the same degree to which we call upon him. So we not only need to know what to say, but how to call upon the name of the Lord. That's the thing. It's not some magical formula, just say the words. There's the how. What's the intent of the heart when we call upon him? Okay. While it is important to, that we understand the actual meaning of each of the words that make up these 13 characteristics of God, the underlying principle being behind proclaiming them is what we need to understand. It's uh, similar to being at the forefront of the battle carrying the flag. Okay, you're at the forefront. You're proclaiming God's name out there. You want everyone to see him, not you carrying the flag, but to see the flag. Okay, <clears throat> there's an ancient saying that goes, there is no king without a people. If there's no people, who are you the king of yourself? Big deal. Okay. When the subjects proclaim, long live the king, they are not simply just recognizing that he's the king, as you would say to a wall, you are a wall. Okay. All right. You are declaring when you're saying God saved the king, you're declaring your loyalty. And you're accepting the yoke of his kingship, what he wants you to do, you're going to do. So when we sing or proclaim God is king, you're saying, over me. 
<laughs> which means he's the boss and not us. Through our active acceptance of his rule, we literally create the kingship of God here on earth. Therefore, disobedience or non-acceptance of his will is to negate his kingship. When you don't do what he says, you're saying you're not my king. And honoring the majesty of God is also very different from merely obeying his commands. God's covenant ensures that our prayer of his 13 names will always be effective. When we declare the recognition of God's names of mercy as revealed to Moses, it will have a direct effect upon us and its manifestation on earth. All right. If you remember, Moses appealed to God's attributes of mercy and it brought results. It spared the nation of Israel. So we too may call upon these attributes of his covenantal name. He has given to us when we cry out in prayers of repentance for mercy for our family, our friends, as well as for ourselves. So the first name, the Lord, we're going to take a look at this. When we call upon the name of the Lord, it is the Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey, and basically when you know the name you have off, hey, it says, I exist. So the first thing we do is call upon the one who has always existed, who still exists and will exist in the world to come. And then the second time, it's the Lord God. Here we say the Lord as well. But I want you to listen to this first. This name has at the core of the meaning is compassion. That's what this name means. Why is it mentioned twice? Listen to this. It is taught that the first time it represents God's compassion before we sin, and the second time is compassion after we sin. How often do we see, even with our own eyes, that unrepentant sinners continue to exist? You know, the soul of sinners is going to die. Well, sinners still exist. How come? <laughs> Because God has compassion even after we sin. All right. Uh, one sage said God tolerates sin in anticipation of the greater good that will follow from their repentance. Isn't that amazing? God wills the world to continue to exist and he wills the existence of our free will. Evil is not the object of or goal of God's will. God does not desire evil even though its existence is included in his will. You follow me? He doesn't desire evil, but he allows evil to be in existence. People wonder why horrible things happen. Okay, well, listen, let's look at Exodus 18.23, or Ezekiel, I mean. Ezekiel 18.23, God says, have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? Says the Lord God, the merciful judge, and not that he would return from his ways and live. So when we recite this first attribute of God, we should have in mind, I'm calling on the name of God. He's the one who brings the whole world into existence. And I request kindness and mercy simply because I exist. He made me. And if he makes me, I'm going to ask for, maybe it's not mercy or compassion because I didn't do anything wrong. Maybe just mercy or compassion because I have a need. All right? And so, hey, God, you created me. I exist. I'm calling on you. Help. <laughs> you see, it's, it's a relationship. I do not request kindness on account of my great personality or my conduct, but simply because I am literally fulfilling the will of God that the world exists and I'm a part of it and you wanted me to exist. Right? Ecclesiastes 3, everything was made on purpose. Okay. When we cried the second time out, the Lord and then God, after we have sinned, with all the feelings of shame and failure, we are essentially saying this time, okay, I've not, filled the divine, I've not fulfilled the divine will. Nevertheless, this is because of the possibility of my repentance that you, you know, for the greater good, even though I'm filled with shame and humiliation and stained with sin, I'm still an object of your will. So the second time is like, 
Even though I've sinned, you will me to remain alive that I might repent. Wow. So the first time we say, Lord, is Lord, I exist. Be merciful and compassionate because I'm part of your creation. And then the second time is, and after I've sinned, you continue to let me live so I might repent and you'll get even greater glory. Amazing. I am filled with shame and humiliation and stained with sin, and yet I'm still an object of your will. We now come to the third name, and it is L, God, or L. Okay, let me turn off my stupid diabetes alarm thing. Check your diabetes. Okay, so the third is L. Now, L like Elohim, show for Elohim, refers to God, his power, his might, his strength. He is the king who requires justice. He's the judge of all of the earth. And look what Abraham says in Genesis 18, 25. Be it far from you to do after this manner, to slay the righteous and the wicked, and the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from you shall not the judge of all the earth do right. Well, L, God is saying, I want your power to act against your very nature of justice that I can continue to exist. God, you are the king, the judge, but I want you to go against your own commands and forgive me so I can continue to exist. God is judge. He is powerful. When he says, how many of you know in the movies when the king says, it's off with your head if you don't? Well, here is God is king. And remember in the book of Esther, you can't go against what the king said. Well, here God says it. And if he changes his mind, all of a sudden we question him. Oh, is God? Oh, he changes his mind. God's fickle. So if God said something and then he changes his mind, what does that do his character? And here, we're asking God to go against his very nature so we can continue to exist. And what does strength or power have to do with God's attribute of mercy? We're going to talk about that next week. So, let's stand.